Hi, it's October 15th. I'm Kevin Ann at Eagle Strong Voice, and I've got an open letter to the Aboriginal People's Television Network, so-called, that I'd like to share with you. It's uh, something I entitle, I'm not laughing with you, I'm laughing at you. Dear APTN and assorted minions, I was going to write to your lawyers about all this, but you know how humorless those guys tend to be. And this involves what's ultimately a laughing matter, despite the seriousness of the garbage you've been up to. This week, as part of a grossly misrepresentative smear piece you've done about me, you've been broadcasting my image on your network after I expressly denied you permission to do so. Somewhere I read that's against the law. You've also publicly lied about the work I've been doing at the Branford Indian Residential School in our search for the mass graves of the children who died there. Let me say first off that I've tried unsuccessfully for several years to interest your station in our campaign to open these graves and bring the murdered children home for proper burial. Ever since the farcical apology for genocide issued in June 2008 by your paymaster, the Prime Minister of Canada, you've ignored the whole issue, including the list of 28 mass grave sites near former Indian residential schools that I sent to your head office in April of 2008. I'm sorry, April 2010. You guys, your, your silliness have got me all distracted. Even last year, when 10 Mohawk elders gave me written authorization to commence surveys and digs at the Brantford Mushhole Residential School, and when we actually uncovered evidence of buried children there, APTN refused to broadcast this historic news. So it's quite odd and humorous that APTN is now trumpeting itself as providing the real story about the missing residential school children in Canada. Exactly how you know anything about the issue is beyond me, considering how steadfastly you've shunned it. But the heat is on you now, obviously, with the guilty government and church's need for a new big spin on the matter of mass murder of Indian children. Or is it merely coincidental that you guys are suddenly interested in missing Indian kids now that the whitewash those killers call Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission is about to issue its final report? A report, incidentally, that's a $68 million version of the Warren Commission report, except that it does the Americans one better. There wasn't even a lone gunman responsible for the crime up here, apparently, since nobody was responsible for the deaths of those 50,000 Indian kids, considering that nobody is standing trial for the death of even one child, especially not the church is responsible. So I get it. But in your zeal to suddenly look credible on the issue and help discredit me and the only independent inquiry into the mass graves, your bits of journalistic integrity have vanished quicker than death records into a church shredding machine because you're openly lying about me on the public airwaves. One of your recent inflammatory pieces, for instance, claimed that our survey team at the Brantford Mushhole School site relied only on, quote, psychics to identify the spot where children were buried. I guess you guys don't watch YouTube, because in early October 2011, images of our scanning the grounds of the school with a ground-penetrating radar machine were posted all over the internet. I can send you the link again, if you like. You also claim that our digging up a small, two-foot deep, five-foot square patch of earth near the school has, quote, irretrievably damaged the site, unquote, which is an odd thing for you to say, considering that the site encompasses more than 300 acres. What you conveniently don't mention on the air is the significance of the evidence we dug up at the mush hole, namely buttons from children's uniforms at the school entangled in tree roots. Eyewitnesses say that when kids were buried on the grounds, trees were always planted on top of the remains. Newsworthy? Apparently not to the APTN. What you do consider important is to spread lots of gossip, innuendo and unsubstantiated nastiness about me personally and pass that off as objective coverage of murdered Native kids. Which brings us to those bones we uncovered. What you claim about all that is that I, a white guy, went in like a gangbuster at the Mushhole School and dug up some animal bones and then tried passing them off as human, and thereby so angered the Mohawk elders they asked me to leave. That's also what the government and church spin doctors are saying about me, but I guess that's just another coincidence, eh? What actually happened is this. With full permission, I conducted two small digs in the presence of authorizing Mohawk elders, and we have pictures of that, and we uncovered many bones close to and mixed with the school uniform buttons I mentioned. That same week, an archaeologist named Chris Nargang and an Ontario fire marshal named Greg Olson 
sat down with me and the Omohawk elders and studied the bones we unearthed. After a half hour of examining one small bone, Olson said, and Nargang agreed with him, quote, I'm 90% certain this is human, probably a small child's knee socket, but we'll need a forensic ex examination to be sure. Well, on the basis of that remark, I subsequently showed that bone on a YouTube broadcast and a Toronto TV program, and I repeated Greg Olson's words, that it was probably human, but we weren't sure yet. The bones were then sent off to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington for analysis. Their chief forensic specialist took three weeks to examine them, and then he told me over the phone, quote, they could be human, but I think they're animal. I'll need more samples to be sure, unquote. Well, frankly, his ambiguous comments seemed strange to me, and I believe he was influenced to say what he did and to be deliberately vague. It wouldn't be the first time a government scientist has responded thus when faced with the remains of probably murdered Indian kids. Meanwhile, back in Brantford, a woman named Jan Longboat, who admits that she receives government money, has been smearing me and all over the community from top to bottom and paying a man named Frank Miller to join the Trash Kevin Anna campaign. The two of them created enough confusion to put any further digs on hold. And again, I guess this is a coincidence, right? Miller is the first and primary Mohawk that APTN went to for the real story about Kevin Annett and the Mushhole Dig. Of course, you know, I'm not the issue at all. All those dead Mohawk children are, as are those who put them in the ground, namely the Anglican Church of Canada and the federal government. An Anglican Bishop Bob Bennett in London, Ontario, has been sitting on hard evidence, including an 1870 Crown document outlining a plan to wipe out the Mohawks. Hard evidence that reveals that the Church knew about the deaths of all the Mushhole children and did absolutely nothing about it over many decades. Funny that none of that made it into your programs, especially since, once again, I shared all of that information with you, as I learned it from former Anglican Church researcher Leona Moses, who asked me, to make it public. You still are getting my updates on email, aren't you? Well, look, I know the pressure you guys are under. Last January, Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, told top Canadian Anglican leader Fred Hiltz that not one church record about the Brantford School is to be made public. Well, when I studied law, that was an obstruction of justice, to even suggest that to somebody. But I guess he can get away with that. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? But he didn't call you guys by any chance, did he? Well, don't worry. All of this stuff is being documented and will be broadcast soon all over the world through the online common law court I'm involved in that's publishing hundreds of exhibits detailing the crime and cover-up of genocide in Canada, something else you've never mentioned over your programs. So get the story straight, guys, and stop lying about me and what's going on. But of course, if you engage in that kind of journalistic integrity, which is so rare in Canada, it'll cost you your jobs and your reputation, and perhaps a lot more. But that's the price of truth. Cheers. I'm Kevin Annan.